Come, Holy Spirit, be in this place. Set our hearts on fire with your love. What we know not, teach us. What we have not, give us. Who we are not, make us. Amen. Please be seated. First of all, yes, the lozenge is a part of the liturgy. (laughs) One is taught as a rookie very early on that no sermon should ever last longer than one lozenge. It's a timer. What do we hear? What do we hear today that teaches us anything that may be useful as we enter our annual meeting, as we walk boldly into 2024 and the search that we'll find the next rector of this parish. Well, it seems to me there's an embarrassment of riches today, and there's at least five or six sermons, I promise I will only preach one, about them. It seems to me that the overarching question that these scriptures invite us to think about and answer in our prayers is, What do you know, when do you know it, and what do you do with that? We hear very late in the story, in Deuteronomy, that there will be a succession. That Moses eventually, despite his being an extraordinary leader, is going to die. And as that story plays out, the subtext is beautiful and very clear, apparently, Moses is buried by God himself in a place that no one can find. And the successor will come. And then, during that little bit of rhetoric between God and the leadership of Israel, it's really clear, and oh, by the way, that prophet will have my words in his mouth. Now, please, for goodness sake, Do not assume that we are searching here for the successor to Moses. We're not. For a couple of reasons. First of all, priesthood and prophecy are two very different voices, and that would be a very, very troubled person. The priestly voice and the prophetic voice oftentimes run headlong into each other, and it is a hard life to live. Only one person in the tradition that we know has ever had to suffer those dual gifts, and that was Ezekiel. And his writings are mystical, and at once, at the very edge of glory as human beings know it, and very, very pained. But we hear about a succession in Deuteronomy, and we hear the lovely report from Capernaum, as Mark recalls it, about Jesus teaching as one who has authority. Now you need to know, I'm going to make a flat-footed statement here, and I will defy the entire 2,000-year-long tradition to countermand what I'm about to say. The church has only ever had one problem, and it is the problem of authority. Even before he is crucified, buried, and resurrected, they're wanting to know who's going to sit next to him in heaven. The church's only problem has ever been authority. Who gets to speak the final word? Who gets to decide things, what those words will be, what the ministry will be, how it will be led and done? And that one single problem, the problem of authority, not power, the problem of authority has plagued us as God's people from even before the time of Jesus of Nazareth. Witness the lesson from Deuteronomy. Who will be the one who will speak with authority? How will that authority be worn and exercised. What righteous power will derive from that moral authority? And in what direction will it take the community of God? 
These are vast questions. They cannot be answered even in an entire year of thinking and preaching about them. And yet they're all right there in the scriptures that we have for today. And Paul, God bless him, gives us the essay. Paul gives us a way to better understand these bigger questions of succession and authority in talking about something seemingly simple. Now, we only have half of the correspondence. You need to remember that Paul did not write to Corinth just out of the blue. With the exception of his letter to Rome, which is an introductory letter and was not answering a letter that he had received, with the exception of Romans, Paul doesn't write a letter unless he's been sent a letter, unless he's been asked a question to which there is an answer required in writing from the apostle himself. Corinth has sent him a question about eating food that had been set at the altar of an idol. And we look at that and you say, are you kidding? You're wasting Paul's time with this? This is majoring in the minors. we got other things to talk about. No. <laughs> First of all, Paul takes seriously the question of the church where she finds herself at Corinth in that moment. He does not talk down to the church at Corinth. He encourages the church at Corinth to access knowledge and an answer that they already have, but simply need to have legitimated by his apostolic authority. It's the endorsement of common sense, friends. And so Paul, when he is asked, so what about, I mean, if I put bread and, I don't know, a pear in front of the household deity and then all of a sudden that gets eaten, what happens? And Paul's low-tech answer is, well, you ate some bread and a pear. But beyond that, he invites out of people what they know. The baseline, beautiful common sense of redeemed children of God. That's us. And what does he say? Overtly, you know that it does not make any difference one way or the other. You know this, and here's the question, and this is the reason that it is so important, is knowing that, what do you do with it? What do you do with it? Now, what we know, any physical anthropologist, biological anthropologist, any psychologist or psychiatrist will tell you that intellect and ego are inextricably bound that how you present and who you think you are in the world and the edge with which you lead is rooted in large part in the ability to do the head work around being a human being. That in and of itself seems to be pretty low tech, but a lot of people forget it. And there is often a disconnect. There are very, very, very smart people who could not pour a gallon of water out of a bucket if the instructions to do so were on the bottom of the bucket. <laughs> we know this. We know this. And there are other people who do not present as being particularly frisky of mind, not particularly subtle of intellect, in whom dwells a deep wisdom. One of the things that Paul wants to encourage Corinth about is to say, you need the smart guy and you need the wise one. There is a way for both of these voices to operate. It is clear that Paul tends toward there being a predominance or a dominance in the voice of wisdom over the voice of intellect but both have their place. And so it is, he writes back and he says, it's not a problem for you because you wrote the letter to me. If there's a kid among you who's watching you 
and looking to you for leadership. I've always been troubled by people who say, I want to let my kids decide for themselves. Faith is taught, friends. It has to be taught. And if there's somebody watching who respects you, who understands that you have some entree with sacred practice, that God talked to you is not a foreign language, and they see you do something that runs them off the rails, then Paul says, <laughs> now we got a problem. This is an echo of what God is saying in Deuteronomy. Say what I tell you to say, and do what you know to do, and do not go astray. So it is that living by example becomes the emergent theme. And what Paul says to Corinth, it's the emergent theme in what God says to the one who will be the successor to Moses in Deuteronomy. And it is the amazement of the, the absolute stunned amazement of the synagogue at Capernaum when they say, it's not just that this guy can talk to an evil spirit. Parenthetically, isn't it interesting that the evil one knows exactly who he is? Not just that he may speak to an evil spirit, but he does this as one who has authority. So, we are invited, each of us, to the degree that we have the lights to see it and the ears to hear it, we are invited into that place of personal authority that tends to make us grown-ups. And we are invited into that place of personal authority that makes a contribution, meaning that the community will get better. And we are invited into that place of personal authority where everything that is done not only builds up the corporate community, but those closest to us. Those closest to us. Every person that is sitting in this church right now is perceived by another, whether you know it or not, as being their best friend. Sometimes you don't know. And yet, the example that you live, your words, those things that you do, matter. They carry extraordinary moral freight. This is not meant to scare us. This is not meant to make us edgy, wondering where the landmines are so we don't step on them, because we're going to step on them. This encourages us. Paul encourages us. He says, be grown-ups. Be joyful grown-ups. Be people who are seeking more and more each day through prayer and action to be the people God is inviting us to be. Because the world is watching it is not an overstatement and it is not meant to be hyperbolic when I say the call of the next rector of the parish is a call that has church-wide implications. It's that important. And it requires the sincerity and the devotion, the personal devotion in prayer and the corporate devotion in our common labors together it requires all of that so that what is done will be something that God might look at and say, yeah, yeah, God love them. They stumbled a little bit, but they got there. Yeah. These are the people for whom I sent my son who died, was buried, whom I raised and ascended to sit at my right hand so that they might better understand who they are 
and in more maturity within themselves might better understand who I am, says God. So, listen to Paul. Know that he doesn't care whether you eat food sacrificed to idols or not. Because the critical thing is you know it's an idol, not God. And live a life that invites people to a similar maturity and joyful freedom inside the parish in this splendid old town of Stevensville, in this diocese of Easton, in the Holy Church Catholic throughout the world, and indeed in the world for whom he came and gave his life. This is such good news, friends. This is such good news. Because the only, if if it's true, and I know it is, that the only problem the church has ever had is authority, a part of that problem is people not understanding the authority that their baptisms have conferred on them. Good news. Amen.